Hey everyone, I'm Dave Phillippe. I'm the Director of Film and Video at the Wexner Center for the Arts at Ohio State. Um, people might not think of a discussion about sports as something that comes out of the Wexner Center regularly, um, but we actually have a history of presenting programs that consider uh, the intersection of sports, politics, social justice, uh, and the broader culture. And with the shutdown, there's a dearth of live sports events on the calendar, which has resulted in even more national attention being paid to the ESPN 10 part series, The Last Dance, which chronicles the 1997-98 Chicago Bulls season, Michael Jordan's final season with the team and the last of the championships won during Jordan's tenure. The series is not only an engrossing history of that season, but really of Jordan's entire career and the way the NBA and sports in general evolved in large part due to his iconic presence and influence. As we get ready to watch the final two episodes of the series, we thought it would be interesting to invite two experts to share their thoughts on the film and this period in sports history. Clark Kellogg starred for the Ohio State basketball team from 1979 through 82 and was named first team all Big Ten in his final season. He was the eighth overall pick in the 1982 NBA draft by the Indiana Pacers and named to the all-rookie team. Today, he is perhaps best known for his 25 years as the lead college basketball analyst for CBS Sports, and he is also a past member of the Ohio State Board of Trustees. Also joining us is Columbus poet, critic, and essayist Hanif Abdu. Hanif's work has been published in many outlets, including New York Times, Pitchfork, and NPR. And he's the author of many books, or four books, including the, not four, I guess could be many, um, including the critically acclaimed, They Can't Kill Us Until They Kill Us from 2017, also known as The Wolf Book in Our House, and 2019's Go Ahead in the Rain, Notes to a Tribe Called Quest, which includes a wonderful section comparing Fife Dog to the Knicks' John Starks. Hanif often weaves sports references into his work. Among his numerous poems are All the Boys on the East Side Love Larry Bird, and When I Say Loving Me is Kind of Like Being a Chicago Bulls Fan, as just a couple of examples. Thank you both of you guys for joining us. Um, it, it occurred to me this morning, um, before we jump into the last dance, looking at that, um, Clark, could you take us back maybe just a couple of months? For me, um, and I know for a lot of people, when this really, this, this shut-in started getting really real is when, you know, locally when the Arnold Classic was canceled, then all of a sudden all these conference tournaments and basketball started being um, canceled. And then when, you know, the unthinkable, something like the NCAA basketball tournament is all of a sudden canceled. What was going through your mind? Because you're so involved with, with that. Well, I'll tell you what, Dave, it was um, really rapid in terms of how it cascaded south. Uh, we typically have a meeting, a gathering of all of our CBS and Turner sports family in person in New York the Monday before Selection Sunday, which would have been March 9th. We had to do that based on the protocols of not gathering large numbers of people together mm -hmm. by phone. And at that time, there was still a good sense of and feeling that we would go forward with the tournament, perhaps with some modifications and adjustments. And then really the tipping point for me and for all of us was when Rudy Gobert of the Utah Jazz tested positive for the coronavirus on a Wednesday night and the NBA immediately suspended its season. And then Thursday is when all of the other sports events started to follow suit, including the NC, the Big Ten, the conference tournaments that were going on across the country mm -hmm. and the Big Ten tournament specifically. And once that happened, and I thought it was just a matter of time before we found out that March Madness would be canceled. And it was a jolt, but it was clearly the right decision, the only right. decision right. that could be made. But it does create a bit of a void and a sense of loss when you've been attached to not only the event, but the people that are part of it across the whole landscape of everybody's involvement, even the fans yeah. peripherally, because it's such an exciting, galvanizing, uplifting type of, the, of an event for so many folks and to not have that be part of the calendar really um, in many ways drove home the severity and seriousness of, of where we are. Yeah, well said. Um, so turning back to the last dance and kind of to just what Clark was saying, you know, there's this void on the sports calendar and I think, you know, the last dance was supposed to air in June, I think maybe during the 
NBA Finals or maybe right Correct. after, and mm -hmm. ESPN kind of sensing this void moved moved it up. And um, of course, it would have been popular no matter what, um, given the yeah. subject matter. But I think it's been the center of even more discussion just because there's well, there's nothing else really for sports commentators and talk show people and whatnot to to talk about. Um, Hanif, let's start with you. Um, as I mean, it's interesting. We have kind of a little bit of a mix of ages here. When when you're watching, um, when you've been watching The Last Dance, what are your you know what does it make you remember? What what does it um, bring back for you from that era of, of the NBA, Jordan, and, and kind of everything? Well, I mean, I think primarily a thing that I've been thinking about a lot is how. Michael Jordan, for me, and I think a lot of people of my generation is is remembered first and foremost by the highlights, um, by championships, by the playoff highlight moments. But um, you know, for someone who grew up in Columbus, a lot of my memories do revolve around the regular season, be it turmoil or the quest to get 72 wins, or um, you know, those kind of like early 90s seasons where you could see it all coming together. Part of that is if you grew up in Columbus um, or around Ohio, and you didn't have cable like my family growing up, you could still get WGN, you know, and WGN would show every Bulls game. Yeah. And so, you know, I grew up just watching Bulls regular season games, and I grew up in a household also with Knicks fans. <laughs> um, most of my family is from New York, and so, you know, my parents love the Knicks. Um, and I am not from New York and had no real sports team allegiance for the, the early years of my life, and so it was kind of fascinating um, being one of those people who just loved watching a player, um, who loved watching Michael Jordan um, kind of turn it on in the regular season when he knew he wanted to win, which is almost always. Um, but it was also interesting watching that 98 Bulls team. Um, what I love about the documentary is that it doesn't shy away from uh, talking about the season that that 98 Bulls team had come off of. Um, and then that slow start they got off to without Pippen. Um, and, you know, I remembered watching them struggle as a kid early on and kind of mourning that and thinking I was watching the end of the dynasty happen in real time. You know, 98, there were still teams that, that felt like they could beat them. You know, there were still teams that felt like, um, you know, they, the Pacers were, were good uh, and, and, and pushed them to the playoffs. So it felt like the Bulls could lose. They seemed inevitable. They seemed... Uh, not as as inevitable as they once were. How about you, Clark? How about you, Clark? Seeing you know, seeing the documentary. I mean, for you, you're obviously coming at it at a at a different perspective. You your your career overlapped with the beginning of, of Jordan's, and we talked yeah. about the other day. Um, you played him six times in his rookie year. And you guys yeah. won four out of or yeah, four out of six. Yeah. Um, yeah. Take us back to you know. Uh, just maybe that period of the NBA, and then here comes this guy who, you know, very quickly becomes, you know, like a different kind of NBA star compared to some of the people that came before him. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed hearing Hanif's perspective from the standpoint of um, growing up in Columbus, but not really having an allegiance to a team and just watching a guy mm -hmm. and really attaching to that particular guy and then having a household that also included Knicks fans, <laughs> and they can be, in my experience, some of the most rabid and loyal and passionate fans. It would have been kind of fun to see that dynamic play out. But, <laughs> you know, f but for me personally, Dave, um, clearly it brings back a lot of memories. Uh, I, you know, one of the things that, that resonates is the struggle that championship teams have to endure. And so often people don't get to see that. And to Hanif's point, that 97 season was a culmination of a great championship run. And then all of the turmoil around this being the last year that Phil Jackson was going to coach Michael, not wanting to play for another team and all of the drama without Scotty, his injury, his contract. So that brought back memories. I remembered that, but it really kind of crystallized and um, laser focused some of that. And then obviously I was very much affiliated with the Indiana Pacers during that time. Uh, got my broadcasting start with the Pacers in 87 when I had to retire and was doing quite a bit of television for the Pacers from 1988 until 2011. So that was a really ascending time for the Pacers as an NBA franchise. They had their own battles with the Knicks in the early mid nineties. And then mm -hmm. really um, 
to Hanif's point, the Pacers felt they were good enough to beat the Bulls in 98. And there wasn't that same sense of invincibility about them that had existed on past teams. But it brings back a lot of um, really fun, good memories of competition. Um, and then Jordan's rise, my goodness, it was like a meteor in terms of how quickly it happened. And you can't isolate the rise or the greatness of individuals, whether it's in sports or activism or business from the environment and the, and the tenor of the time. So there were a lot of factors that converged to allow the greatness of Michael to take on a whole nother dimension in terms of not just performance on the floor, but brand building, global icon status, and those types of things. Clearly, his performance drove that, but there were so many other factors that elevated it to one of those um, Mount Rushmore type guys now, or legendary guys. And that was really uh, fun to kind of revisit, sitting in the seat that I sit in now with many years going by, and also knowing that I was living some of that on the periphery as a broadcaster for the Pacers. Yeah, you bring up a good point. I mean, you know, especially maybe for younger people, looking back at the 80s, there were some great teams, especially in the East. You know, you had the Celtics and the Sixers going at it. Yeah, yeah. The Bucks were really good, and they never right. passed those teams. Yeah. And I think your point that, you know, you're, he's also a product of his time. I mean, in a way, those, those teams and then people like, you know, Magic, obviously, and Larry Bird, they kind of teed up this next level of, of NBA um, influence and and uh, popularity, and he, he did come out. He was like the perfect player to come along, you know, at that yeah. at that time. Um, could you? What well, I can't remember which episode it is, but they talk about Jordan's rookie year with the Bulls, and he they kind of talk about he you know he came into the locker room and maybe guys weren't taking it that seriously. Maybe they were doing some things they shouldn't be doing or going out all night, you know, partying and. Um, you know, as someone who played in the NBA during that time, you don't have to go into too great a detail or, or name names or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was the culture, you know, quite a bit different? Yeah, even in it was, it was totally different than what you experience and see now. For one, you didn't get a chance to see what was going on in locker mm -hmm. rooms and on the buses to the degree that you can now. Social media is really taking you behind the scenes and giving greater access. But I can recall, I was drafted, I was 21 years old when I got drafted by the Pacers and I think it was, I was one of the five youngest guys in the league at that time, at 21, and there were only 23 teams. The league had not expanded yet. Um, the popularity of, Lee, of the league was nowhere near where it is today. As a matter of fact, in the early 80s, some of the NBA finals and playoff games were on tape delay, which is impossible right. for some younger folks to, to, to believe, but it wasn't shown live. And so there was a different, different, and there was a different culture. I mean, the league was older. And there was still a little bit of that transition from the 60s and 70s, mid-70s with some of the guys in that they used the offseason to enjoy themselves and then use the first part of the season to get in shape. So on our bus, there would be a couple of the veterans on the back of the bus smoking. Or after every game and practice, there was beer in the locker room available for the players. And after games, you might see guys – sliding out of the hallway of the locker room with an open can of beer. It was par for the course. It was normal. So I certainly can relate to some of that difference. And then being a young guy, you're watching some of these guys you've watched from a distance and admired, and now you're up close to them. It can be a tad overwhelming. The one thing that keeps you sane is you're in the league, you've realized a dream, and now you want to prove that you belong. I think every young player, starts from that premise. One, you're in all, I'm here. But then once you get beyond that, it's like, I got to prove that I can stay. And so that tends to take your focus. But it was definitely a different type of culture. No private planes for the most part, commercial travel, early get ups, but still the realization of a dream for a, for a young guy coming from Cleveland. And Eve, what are some of, have been some of your favorite parts of the series so far? Um, for people that, I'm guessing if you're, if you're watching this interview, you've 
hopefully watch some of it, but um, it's a mixture of contemporary interviews with, you know, Phil Jackson, a lot of the players, a lot of the executives, some of the reporters that were, were covering the team, um, mixed with this amazing archival footage that was shot during that last season that uh, I guess Jordan had to give his approval for it to ever see the light of day, and he, and he finally <laughs> did. Um, I'm just wondering, Hanif, as a, you know, real basketball fan, a real NBA fan like you are, if there were, have there been any surprises in, in watching the documentary so far? Um, surprises, I'm not sure, but I, I will say that a, a thing that, um, you know, I don't remember Scottie Pippen's contract. I don't remember the tension around Scottie Pippen's contract. Mm -hmm. And it's funny that Clark, um, that brought up social media because I, through the first couple episodes, I kept thinking, gosh, if social media was around during this time, right, I can't imagine there would be a minute where we wouldn't hear about Scottie Pippen's contract and the tension around Scottie Pippen's contract and the trade rumors. Like, I don't even remember the trade rumors from 98 with Scottie Pippen. Um, I, I think maybe I vaguely remember them, but there's a way that the NBA is kind of injected into or professional sports in general. But I think particularly with the NBA, because more trades happen or at least more trade rumors happen, or at least uh, trade rumors are a bit more delicious than they are in other sports. Um, they kind of permeate a news cycle in a way that um, wasn't happening as, as well back then. Um, I remember being really young and getting the Jordan rules. Weirdly, the Jordan rules is one of the first um, large books I read. Wow. I don't know how to call this, like not a chapter book, but a book that's maybe a bit larger than a chapter book. <laughs> yeah. Jordan was one of the first ones I read because I was so fascinated by Michael Jordan. And it's so funny because I was a kid only reading the book and not watching the news. I didn't even realize that the book was such a scandal. It was just, you know, of course, a few years later, I realized it was. But at the time, it was just like, this is information from someone who tracked with the team um, for a year. It was similar to um, Mitch Album had that book about the Fab Five, um, mm -hmm. which, like, obviously parts of that book have been uh, debunked in, in the years. But <laughs> when I read that book on the Fab Five, and I was kind of like, wow, this kind of um, on-the-ground sports reporting is fascinating. So what can I read next? And I got the Jordan rules. Um, so there's, there's nothing surprising me because of the ways I immersed myself um, in wanting to know about what was happening behind the scenes. But I will say there have been some really exciting and delightful, you know, that dream team, the, the, the footage of the dream team practice is so great. And I think to be a young basketball fan, I mean, when the dream team was, you know, the thing, I was maybe 10. Um, and to be a young basketball fan and have the dream team as, as uh a group of players you could watch just felt so incredible on the surface, you know, not knowing how rugged and aggressive the practices by the scenes were and not knowing anything about the tensions that might have existed between um, the old guard and the new guard. There was something really exciting about this assembly of players uh, who I'd only ever watched on their separate teams, mm -hmm. most of them coming together for what just felt like a once in a lifetime experience. And I think that, um, you know, I count myself very fortunate to have lived through that dream team um, and to live through the subsequent Team USA. It's not all of them as, as wonderful, obviously, but perhaps um, the kind of mirroring of that dream team, which was a USA team that had like Kobe and LeBron and Prime Carmelo and all these folks, it felt like a book ending to this really great thing. So um, I've been trying to temper my own uh, instinct to delve too deep into just whimsical nostalgia romanticizing but when I think about that dream team and how that dream team really shaped and really galvanized like an entire neighborhood of basketball players for me, you know, we would watch those games and if there would still be daylight left in the day, we would run out and go shoot, you know? Um, <laughs> and so I, I think about that dream team a lot and I, I really love getting that dream team footage and also, um, you know, kind of seeing Magic and, uh, Magic and MJ go back and forth because I, I, the one thing that interests me in the NBA now um, is how, like, what young player will be the next generational superstar to take the reins from LeBron whenever LeBron is ready to give that up. But I've seen that tension play out in my life with the NBA twice, maybe three different times over now. Mm -hmm. So it's, that, that is fascinating. Yeah, and, and that that's what brings up another good point. Um, and I think Clark alluded to it earlier, how you know, Jordan was kind of this transitional player between one era of the NBA to the next era of the NBA. And 
maybe Clark, you could speak to this, how um, Jordan kind of was this transition to when, uh, you know, obviously there was Larry and Magic and then Jordan. And then there seemed to be this kind of period between Jordan and the next era, however you want to define it, where um, players were, you know, getting heat from the league for what they wore and, you know, tattoos and stuff like that. And however, whatever years you want to use to define that to the point now where the players have all the power. Yeah. I shouldn't say all the power, but they have more than any other sports league, the players have the power. And if you could maybe talk about that as a, as a former player, um, Jordan's kind of position in this transitional moment, moving, you know, being from a, a, a league where it was kind of a traditional sports league to now where the players do have so much more visibility, power, you know, you name it. Yeah, you know, that really is an interesting um, evolution to try to articulate because it really goes way back to the late 60s, early 70s when Oscar Robertson and the um, players gather to form a players union and start collective bargaining and start to get freedom as free agents. And then you have a layer of that improving. And then ultimately we move multiple decades forward and then you start looking at magic and bird revitalizing the league and there were countless there were some other players too that yeah. were part of that dr. evolution j. and pro dr j isaiah thomas um carl malone barkley those guys came along stockton any of those mid 80s kind of hall of fame type guys mm -hmm. were all part of that resurgence but you always have your marquee names and players and bird and magic clearly were there for the bulk of the 80s into the early 90s, and then Jordan comes along. And then you also think about the societal changes, the perspectives, the different aspects of culture that start to be part of that. And then obviously, um, there were a number of players. Grant Hill's ascending career was a little bit stymied by injury because he had some of that same type of game charisma that potentially could have elevated him to a level. And I'm not saying to MJ's mm -hmm. level, but he could have maybe smoothed that transition to where it wouldn't have seen this such a flattening of that ascension. And then obviously you go through the 90s, Jordan steps back, comes back, and then 2003 is kind of when LeBron is drafted. And then um, he's been predicted to be the next great thing for a while. And over, And again, it's a number of factors that converge one, players are becoming, thanks to the work of players before them, in terms of collective bargaining and negotiating better deals and continuing to try to share in the, globe, in the growing popularity and um, business machine of the NBA. Players are becoming a little more savvy as information is more accessible. And we start to talk about social media and that type of stuff. And athletes are starting to control narratives and who they are. And, uh, corporations are riding the wave of, of the NBA's popularity. Players are wondering what that means for them and trying to leverage that. And then you bring it all together. Jordan set the table in many ways for what we see now with the empowerment of um, athletes across um, all sports. But basketball is unique, Davis. Hanif mentioned um, it's unique in that there's an intimacy with the players. There's, a, there's an identifying with the players there's an access to the players that's probably um, the most open in many ways than any other sport. I mean, football is somewhat removed, baseball to a degree, but in a basketball game, you're for the most part, if you're in the building, you can actually be almost like on top of the players. Mm -hmm. And so I think all of that lends itself to uh, what we've seen. And then again, I think the education, um, the money, you can't discount the monetary aspect of it being part of players um, beginning to sense and understand that they have the opportunity to leverage that and get more of it. And with more of that money and notoriety comes um, more leverage and, and um, power. And I think that's, um, that's what we're seeing, which is a good thing from my standpoint. I think it's important that players um, understand what they bring in terms of value and how they can um, not only monetize that, but how they can use that influence as a way for, um, for greater good. Do you have anything about or to add to that, Hanif? Yeah, I mean, I, I think all the time about the sports that I that have this this uh, intimate fan connection, and I always think about the two sports I played: both basketball and soccer. And, and I think um, some of that is just because not to get too, uh, you know, 
high level here, but I think some of that is just connected to the fact that we see, like physically see the players, there's nothing that's here in their faces. Um, they don't wear helmets or hats or masks or, you know, I, I mean, I think there's something, um, and as my era of, of basketball investment kind of picked up, we got to see more of the interior players' lives, um, even before social media. You know, I think, um, you know, I, I, I think players coming out of high school particularly um, led to that kind of fascination, especially with my era of basketball fan, because um, we grew up at a time when players were going straight from high school to the NBA and thriving. Um, and so it felt very possible that we could be walking our very halls with the next NBA superstar um, it, it felt more real than anything else. And so I, I think building an emotional connection to the game um, began because, at least for me, began because I can say, well, there are kids like me. Well, not really like me. I'm like, I'm like five foot six, so not really like me. But kid, <laughs> uh, kids kind of like me uh, going, going to this league I love. Yeah. I don't know if um, – it's funny. One thing I would really um, – I think the, the filmmakers did a really wonderful job in, in mapping out these 10 episodes, um, our episodes five and six together. Uh, in episode five, that's the episode where you see, um, you know, Jordan, how he signed with Nike instead of Converse or Adidas, Adidas in his case. Um, and, you know, the McDonald's commercials, the Be Like Mike Gatorade commercials, the Dream Team, how you know, he, there was just, in a way, nothing else like it. And that's episode five. And then episode six is the Jordan Jordan Rules episode where um, his uh, lack of social activism, I guess, for, as, for one thing, um, you know, the, the rumors of gambling problems and why is he going to Atlantic City during, um, during a important series and, um, I think as a film, it's it's really this wonderful moment that kind of sets us up for the, for the rest of the of the series. But it also it really nicely encapsulates um, I think why Jordan is such a, still such an interesting cultural figure. Where nobody, I mean, in a way, I mean, my eleven year old still talks about getting Air Jordan shoes. She doesn't even really know who he is. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I try to tell her that watch him instead of LeBron, but um, I mean, nothing wrong with LeBron. I don't mean that at all. Um, but if I'm picking someone with 10 seconds left in the game, I'm picking MJ, but that's, that's another discussion. Um, uh, but it's, you know, it, it kind of has everything. It's like this rot, the rise in the creation of this iconic superstar. And then as much as it's possible for someone like him, this somewhat of a, a decline of a superstar. I mean, you know, he didn't fully decline, obviously, but mm -hmm. if, um, if you guys have any thoughts about maybe the interplay of those two episodes? Yeah, I'll let Hanif start there. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the one thing that um, I always found fascinating, both about the Jordan rules themselves, the book, uh, and the stories that would come to light after, is that for me, it just seemed like an inevitability, right? I, I don't think... Um, you can build up and talk about a player's competitiveness and just like ferocity uh, around competition on every level, like on, on micro levels competitive, where it's like playing the quarters with the, with the security guards type mm. level competitive. Right? I don't think you can talk about all of that without also imagining that they're somewhere along the lines um, have to be some victim to that level of competitiveness, even if the victim is himself, right? Um, and so I, I, I appreciated them kind of pushing against that, though I, I don't know. Um, I would have loved to hear more from Jordan's teammates, so I imagine there is stuff that his teammates said that maybe couldn't make the final cut. If he got final approval, he's going to be like, no, no, no. <laughs> you know, the thing that people talk about with Michael Jordan, with Kobe Bryant after him, um, is this ferocious competitiveness um, that took it, that made the hard to play with, right? And so I think what we're seeing is um, a lot of players who probably had to ask the question, is it worth it to endure this because I can win? Like, I know if I got this guy on my side, I'm going to win. Um, you know, is it, he might hit a teammate in the face one day in practice, but you're, you're going to win the game the next, you're the next time out. You're going to win a title. If so I think that he is a player who really asks, asks his teammates to, to really balance a relationship between 
uh, winning and what they endure for the sake of uh, for the sake of winning. I am someone um, who, like, behind me and also all around me, I, I'm a big sneaker person, and I'm, so I'm very happy that they touched down on uh, the Jordan sneaker because I think they're they were such a cultural monument to me growing up and to who I grew up with. Um, many of us, you know, and I think that when you start talking about sneakers and sneaker culture, um, that is another thing that is not without its victims, right? I mean, many of us grew up poor, coveted shoes um, and mowed lawns for them or did some other unsavory things to get money to get them. But, um, and so I think that part, that episode five was really great in framing not only just Michael Jordan signing a sneaker contract, but what Michael Jordan represented in terms of a unique cool, a unique level of cool yeah. that, you know, the sneakers, because I mean, a lot of NBA players had signed, signed sneaker contracts back in the day, but those sneakers weren't moving if those, those NBA players weren't also uh, emitting a level of cool, at least on the court. Michael Jordan, specifically early on, the gold chains in the jersey and the yeah. ability to just kind of glide on the court. There's yeah. something that I think when people are talking about being like Mike, they're talking about that, putting on these shoes and embodying an almost impenetrable level of cool. Yeah, no, that's so well said. And it's something that to me has always been fascinating and how obviously there has to be some greatness, some giftedness in whatever your craft is to rise to the level of notoriety and accomplishment. But there's something else that's somewhat mysterious about what leads the public to embrace this person as their person and to have that be universal. I mean, the court of public opinion can only be driven so much and so far by what you do and your swag. There's something else that's a mysterious piece of the sauce that leads some to get to levels of status and icon and cool, to use your word, Hanif, that resonates across all kinds of lines and only a few get to that point. I mean, LeBron has an element of that. Kobe has an element of that, but you could, you can name them on two hands. If you just stick it, keep it with basketball over the 70, 80 year history of the league. And it's just really fascinating, but it was clear. You can identify it when you see it, but it's hard to know what all goes into it other than, well, part of it we know is great accomplishment and a certain way of accomplishing what you do. But um, he certainly um, brought a level of um, cool swag, confidence. And, and the other thing too, that competitive drive and the, and the exchange of what you're gonna give up to try to win or what you're gonna tolerate or endure for the sake of holding that trophy is really an inherent tension that, that every, I think, champion has to reconcile with themselves in whatever arena you're in. And, you know, you can be really good and may not want to pay that kind of price. Mm -hmm. Subject yourself to um, maybe a punch in the face or a constant um, needling or challenging. But uh, for many, it's worth, the, it's worth what you get at the end of. And that, you're right, the teammates, I'm sure, would have um, some interesting comments um, in terms of how they how they tried to navigate that. There were some, Hanif, that I know of that just um, weren't quite able to, to handle that and either um, left or, or were moved on from the organization because if you couldn't deal with the, um, with the lion, then you probably had to find another uniform. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I mean, who's to say who, what any of us would do in this moment, but in these right. moments... I often think that, um, you know, the NBA is one of those times where the cost of um, the cost of winning for some can feel so steep, but just historically, um, we've put such a high price on having a title and what that means for greatness. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, I think of the Jordan era and I think of all the great players who maybe otherwise would have gotten titles, but didn't. Yeah. The Ewings, the Stockings, the Malones. I think of that incredible Sonics team. You know, there was that Orlando Magic team that had a young Shaq and a prime Penny Hardaway, and the Bulls swept them. You know, they just made they made it look easy for so many other teams that weren't necessarily lesser teams, but yeah. did not have that that person or that player that had that extra thing that pushed them beyond. 
Um, and I, I feel like that is perhaps an increasingly rare trait in some of the NBA players today. I mean, you definitely see it with LeBron at times, um, but there, there aren't a lot of players who you can tell are kind of uh, pushing every single player around them to that next yeah. level. Yeah. Could, to go back to, um, you know, just looking on social media and people's reactions to the film, um, if it seems like there's discussions about who's better, LeBron or MJ, that's one set of conversations. But then if, if there is criticism towards Jordan generated by this series, it's kind of what you've just both been talking about, how, you know, some, some teammates might have viewed him as an asshole or, you know, kind of unbearable to, to be in a locker room with. Um, do you think, um, I don't know, do you think that that part of his uh, drive to excel is, um, do you think he's punished for it in ways that maybe other players wouldn't be like, or maybe like if it's a, a coach who's always yelling at someone, you know, but they keep winning, but it's romanticized. Whereas for Jordan, mm -hmm. do you think he's being unfairly criticized for it? Or do you think that that's just kind of just part of the, the whole package and the way he's viewed? Wow, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I think some of it may have to do, I don't know if it's necessarily unfair, but I do think there might be a little more heavy handedness with it because of the heights that he ascended to mm -hmm. in terms of his notoriety, his accomplishment, his global branding, the whole aura around, the whole persona. And there's a tendency um, with all of us, when somebody is winning on a consistent, regular basis, that at some point we wouldn't mind seeing either them fall or somebody else rise. Mm -hmm. And that's inherent. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm confessing myself. There's a, there's a part of me that sometimes wants to see that in, in the case of somebody that's always, always at the top and always highly esteemed. So I think that may indirectly create this sense of maybe it's a tad unfair or heavy handedness. But I think um, those who have that same type of fire and ferocity and drive, it can be grating to those that are in that circle and in that spectrum, it can be. But most folks would tell you when they've had tough teachers or tough professors or even tough parents, when it's done, from a point of care and a commitment to, to something that you desire to get hold of, many would say that it's worth it, you know, that it's worth that. And it's part of the, part of the price. Everything has cost us something, whatever it is we do or don't do, there's a cost involved. And for that type of achievement, sometimes that is just wrapped into being part of the cost. Yeah, I think too, um, a lot of sports fandom, has always been invested in the aesthetics of hard work, right? And so I think a part of the reason why folks didn't like the Warriors uh, was that it, always, it looked so easy for them yeah. until it didn't, right? It wasn't just that they were good, and it wasn't just that the way they were good was just high volume shooting uh, kind of thing. It's also that for a long time it looked easy for the Warriors. And a part of the reason why the Cavs triumphed over them in that final series when they came back to 3-1 was because it looked like hard work. Right, mm. um, gave off the, the. I mean, it, well, undoubtedly it was hard work. But what the Warriors are doing is hard work too, right? It, it's, yeah. it's, it's hard work to win seventy three games. Um, and so I think sports fans uh, idolized Jordan in some ways um, because he was so good at making these moments look like hard work. And if the work was significantly harder, he would milk that. I'm thinking about the flu game. They showed. Mm. Um, they showed the 98 All-Star game on ESPN last night. And uh, before the 98 All-Star game, which they didn't go to in the, in, the, in the series, Michael Jordan announced that he was sick, right? Um, and he kind of played up this idea that he was sick. And uh, almost on cue, you know, he hits his first basket, really op easy open jump shot. And one of the announcers says, well, he doesn't look so sick now. And as if he heard it, the camera's on Michael Jordan. And almost as if he heard the announcer, he coughs three times. You know, <laughs> it's just what it's so good at the aesthetics of everything looks like. That's I, a great book. I think there's such a um, romantic aspect of that. I mean, I think people love that about Kobe. You know, the yeah. people tell the story about how when Kobe tore his Achilles, he walked off the court 
you know, he made the free throw and walked off the court. And I, I don't know, I'm not necessarily ready to give in to the fact that I think that's necessarily healthy. Um, <laughs> but mm. um, I don't know if that obsession with, with at least the aesthetics of hard work is healthy, but I know that I buy into it as well. Like, despite um, not wanting to as a sports fan, I see myself buying into it. I see myself buying into the mythology of Michael Jordan because uh, it is – more amazing for me to say, gosh, you remember that game he played where he was sick and he couldn't mm-hmm. up mm-hmm. the court? Or, you know, gosh, remember when LeBron came back from 3-1 and almost collapsed on the court after because he gave it his all? And so I, I think so much of this is 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 wrapped up in our uh, larger relationship with romanticism and hard work. Yeah, that's very I, I think you bring up very a great point. point. Um, mm-hmm. You know, Jordan, when you watched him, he, no one was working harder than him. Um, especially after they got past the Pistons. It seemed like no one on the court was tougher than him, but he was this beautiful player to watch. I mean, aesthetically, he was an incredibly pleasing basketball player in all different ways to watch. That's, and I think that goes back to Clark's point, too, about why do some people have this extra something that, where they transcend the, you know, the, the number of people that, that follow them or, or you know, worship them, I guess, even to some point. Um, one last question. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot. Uh, watching the series, what always used to excite me during that time period was this battle between, you know, the Pistons having to overcome. I actually liked the Pistons when they were overcoming the Celtics, but then I wanted the Bulls to knock off the Pistons. And, you know, they're, it was like these teams that were kind of, you know, reloading and getting ready to come back and try it again against these teams that were there. Were there um, you know, their obstacles. And now the NBA has changed to the degree where instead of doing that, you know, players switch teams or, you know, we've seen the, you know, really dramatic examples of LeBron and Chris Bosh and Dwayne Wade or, you know, Durant going to the How do you think it would fit into that philosophy where you, you, instead of maybe, you know, bringing, I mean, obviously the Bulls traded players and got new players and whatnot, but, where, I mean, who would have, no one would have been able to move players around like Jordan or, or attract other players. <laughs> what would it look like in today's NBA, you know? Or would he even want to do it that way, you know? Well, I mean, no, everyone says they don't want to do it until they feel like they got to do it. You know? <laughs> right, that's right. That's I mean, I think, I, you know, and I, I am a little, I will say I'm a bit of a Kevin Durant apologist uh, because I just, I like him so much. Um, but I think that Kevin Durant, he's a perfect example of someone who saw that Oklahoma City had, had they weren't going to get over that hump. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And so I think you have to make a decision. And I think these decisions come quicker these days. So I think it's another thing. Of course, free agency has changed, and trading has changed, all these things have changed. But I think decision making is a lot quicker between these things where it's like, I can't get over this hump, so I'm going to go somewhere else. You know? Um, because I I think Kevin Durant maybe saw Oklahoma City running up against that wall of the Warriors for the next three to five years to come. And um, I think as players start to consider the shortening of a career uh, and the life outside of a career as well, um, a path to winning uh, has, to, has, has to have multiple forks in the road, you know? Um, do I love a rivalry? Yeah, and I miss, I mean, I miss those like Pacers Knicks games and those Pacers Bulls games and those Bulls Knicks games coming up in the nineties were so incredible to watch them. Not even just the playoffs, like in the regular season. Like, they, they were better were, than the finals. Yeah. I mean Jordan and Madison Square Gardens, you know, I would take that. And yeah. so I kind of miss that there aren't really um NBA rivalries. I love a rivalry. I loved this past season, uh seeing the Clippers and the Rockets build up this kind of real tension. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause it, it felt to me like, okay, even if these two teams don't make it to the finals, they might meet in the playoffs and that's going to be a real fun fight to watch. Yeah. All of my uh, reveling in the rivalry now is doing it with the understanding that all those players might be gone in a year. You know, we watched the Thunder, uh, the Thunder and the, the Trailblazers have a, a great, what I thought was the start of a great, budding rivalry in the playoffs last year and then that Damian Lillard shot essentially pulled the pin out from the, the Thunder and now they're an entirely different team. And so um, I, I don't necessarily, I, I hate to sound like an old purist because I know I do. 
if I do uh, dislike the rapid changing of teams and the pace that happens, it's only because I, I grew up watching incredible rivalries in both conferences too. You know, I, yeah. I grew up a Timberwolves fan and to see um, the, the, when I finally got a team that I landed on, I landed on the Timberwolves and to see the Timberwolves and the Spurs all those years really battle it out was one of the really formative moments of my basketball fandom, you know? And I think um, maybe this is because I grew up again in Columbus and the home of a very large and intense rivalry. So, so much of my sports fandom is led through rivalries. But I miss that. I think that this, if there's one thing the NBA is lacking due to all the team shifting, it is yeah. um, the relationship building in many directions that lead mm -hmm. to rivalry. No, that's so well said. And I feel the same way. Obviously, I played and grew up in that time of the 80s. And there being a real systematic progression to how you won championships. It was very rare for a team not to go through the crucible of painful losses to get to a championship level. It just didn't seem to happen. The Sixers had to go through the Celtics multiple times. Couldn't quite get through them. And then my rookie year, they got it done. And then you passed in the Lakers and Celtics back and forth and the Pistons start building and grinding and grunting. And they've got to go through the Celtics to make it happen. And then the Pistons get to the top of the mountain. And now here comes this upstart Chicago team. And now they've got to find a way to go through the crucible of that championship team. And there was just something that appealed to all of us. I think it goes back to what you said, Hanif, that romanticism or that, that romanticism of what hard work, the aesthetics of hard work. And there's something about seeming as though you've had to go through something to get something of value. And now because part of it too is you go from 23 teams to 30 in addition to the ability of teams to move around or players to move around. So it does in some ways dilute what you have. And yet the players are so much better and so much more athletic and skilled across the board. But there is a little bit of a dilution of that concentration of, of age, experience and talent. And um, so I'm a bit more old school in that regard, but I also do appreciate the opportunity that players have to Hanif's point to make those decisions in the context of their careers, what they'd like to achieve and the timeline in which you have to do it. And so therefore it speaks to, I think some of the empowerment and the, uh, the awareness that players have of, of kind of writing their own story. Um, and so I think I'm one that always tries to look at it historically and then at the same time, know that change is inevitable and that some of the change will be more palatable to me and some of it won't, but I won't, uh, I won't, I won't denigrate the change uh, to elevate the past, but I do lean more towards the, uh, the rivalries, the, the working through that championship team to have a chance to have your moment of glory. And that's part of the fun of the, of, of the series for me is just seeing that, that internal struggle mm -hmm. that, uh, and the external, the opponent on the outside or opponents, and then also the challenges that try to work from within to um, derail you. Yeah, I think it, it, the last dance could also apply to just the nature of this team. I'm not sure we're gonna see something like this in any of the sports again, where one of your star players might go off to Las Vegas during the season for a getaway and you know it's it's in a way they're a last of a breed I mean I guess you know the Patriots have certainly had a lot of the success in football but you know that that if there was a 10-part series about that era it's not going to be the same right now I just don't think it's gonna be the same as like someone with I don't think Tom Brady's as interesting as Michael Jordan let's put it that way um, <laughs> um well, this has been great. And I, you know, thanks so much to both of you for, for sharing your thoughts. And um, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, we have done a number of programs about sports and history and sports and, and um, culture. And we hope to continue it in the fall, hopefully in person at some point when audiences can come back. And hope you guys will uh, participate again at some point in the future. It's been great talking to you. Yeah, we'd love to. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Anifa. It was really a pleasure. Enjoy. Can I ask one question before you sure. go? What is it like recording the, the stuff for NBA 2K? 
Because <laughs> I play, it's wild because I play, and I'm like, I'm always like, man, this seems like a dream where you, you know. Uh, oh, man. <laughs> Get well, I mean, hey, I'm so impressed with your fandom and your loyalty to the game. I mean, you're you're into it on both feet and arms and head and everything, man. You're full. You're fully immersed in me, which is um, quite refreshing. But that's been a wonderful joy for me, man. It's um, it just kind of happened on the humble. I had done some work for 2K on the college side 11, 12 years ago. I think actually Doug Collins was supposed to be the um, analyst back in 2008 or nine, they wanted to record during the playoffs and, and he wasn't available because of um, not wanting to tax his voice during that time. And they knew of my work, knew of me, reached out to me. And um, I haven't looked back. It's been a lot of fun. I don't play the game. Obviously I've got adult kids in their thirties. My two boys play and obviously the college generation and your generation too, at least they, they uh, many of them know me more from that. <laughs> and they might know me from my ancient playing days and um, my work as a comment. They've just been a fabulous. It's been a really wonderful way to connect. Um, one, to a great franchise, to a great league, and to um, the, the um, video game generation. It's been, uh, been a lot of fun. been a lot of fun. It's always good hearing you on there. I appreciate you taking the time today. No, I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Hey, thanks, guys, and take care and be well. Yeah, you too, right, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Right, we'll talk to you later. All right. Bye-bye.